Greetings everyone and welcome. You're watching my first ever piano recital titled Esperanto. Might be morning, afternoon or evening depending on where you are watching right now. But I hope you will have a good time regardless because I already have tomato for breakfast and I'm not tending to repeat it. <laughs> I believe you are tuning into this recital expecting some good music. Well, too bad. Composer Claude Debussy said, Music is in the silence between the notes. However, since you're already here, I suppose I should at least tell you why and how I'm standing on this stage. So I was born when I was a baby. Then I picked up the piano two and a half years ago, which means I barely missed out the opportunity to be a child prodigy. And I embarked on this piano journey together with my comrade Professor Ori Itkin, and it's been a wonderful journey of discovery. So I thought maybe it's about time for me to share with you the discoveries I've had so far on my journey, hence this piano recital. Well, the truth is, I started learning the piano out of my own selfishness. I thought it would be really cool if I could play all this beautiful music for my own enjoyment. But then, there's something I realized. You try and think of someone who hates music. We can certainly like and dislike certain kinds of music, but to hate all music, I can't think of anyone. And that's what strikes me. Music seems to be one of those things that are universally shared in our experience. When we listen to a delightful melody, we often feel uplifted, joyful. When we hear dark, gloomy tunes, we often feel heavy and down. Or when we listen to classical music, we tend to feel sleepy. Well, if you fall asleep at any point during my recital, you'll be escorted out through the door and get no refund for your ticket. <laughs> Well, it seems to me that music is quite like a universal language. And in a time where our bodies have to be physically separated, I find music to be a wonderful platform through which our hearts are connected. And through this piano recital, I hope that I could bring all of us a moment where we can just be together and celebrate the beautiful connections we have with each other. I want this to be a great experience for you and the amazing conductor and composer Leonard Bernstein once said, to achieve great things, two things are needed, a plan and not quite enough time. So late last night, I made a plan. <laughs> and that's how I got to be standing here right now. Now before I begin, I would like to thank everyone for watching right now. This recital is dedicated to you. I also like to thank the Office of International Students and Scholars, College of Arts and Science, and the Music Department at St. Thomas. Piano recital becomes a reality because of your tremendous support and work on this. I thank my great sources of inspiration, including Mr. Victor Borch, Ju and Ed Gudisman, Tuset Violin, and Poet Ali. I would also like to thank my piano teacher and comrade, Mrs. Ora Itkin, who asked me to keep her identity a secret, so I won't reveal her name to you. Special thanks to my mom for marrying her husband, and special thanks to my dad for marrying my grandma's daughter. Well then, you are expecting to listen to some good music, so I shall shortly cease to talk nonsense and let music begin, and I hope we won't have quite enough time. The first piece in the program is a sonata by Scarlatti. Scarlatti was a composer of the Baroque music era before he relocated onto an asteroid. Despite spending most of his life working for the royals of Spain and Portugal, Scarlatti remained a poor man, and that was because he was a Baroque composer. 
He did have a prolific career composing 555 sonatas for the keyboard instrument. I will play only one of them because we don't have quite enough time. So it is the sonata in D minor number 9. Next, we have the Fantasia in D minor by Mozart, another D minor. Mozart is oftentimes regarded as one of the greatest prodigies in the history of music. 
starting composing when he was five. He was also a movie star. Have you seen that movie Amadeus? It's like he was born for that role, you know. <laughs> the thing is, his extraordinary genius allowed him to be a huge procrastinator. Apparently, composing the overture for Don Giovanni the morning that it was premiered. It actually went on to become one of his most famous operas. That did not always work out so well, though, as in the case of the Fantasia in D minor. He started composing this around 1782, and nine years later, it was still unfinished. In fact, it was never finished because around that time, Mozart made one of his biggest mistakes in his whole career, which prevented him from composing for the rest of his life. He died. <laughs> so he left us with many unfinished fantasies. So let me procrastinate no further and present to you Mozart Fantasia in D minor.
The next piece that I'm going to play for you is a piece by Claude Debussy, our best number one, because I don't like the second one. <laughs> so Debussy was one of the most influential composers in the Western musical tradition. He, along with Maurice Ravel, whom I will play later, was one of the pioneering figures that founded a whole new style of music. Critics and scholars usually call this style Impressionism, but apparently neither composers were impressed by the term. So uh, the piece that I will play for you is an evocation of the artistic de decoration style called Arabesque, which consists of curvy lines and is often associated with Islamic arts. Arabesque is also the name of a dance position in ballet. So, Debussy, Arabesque number one. Please allow me to gently inform you that musicians absolutely hate phones going off in the middle of a performance. It's very distracting. Now where was I? Oh, Beethoven, that's right. <laughs> this is so distracting. You're so lucky that you're not out there right now.
one, I will be playing for you the Toccata in E flat minor by Cacciatoria. Before I play, please allow me to gently inform you that musicians absolutely hate coughs and sneezes going off during the performance. It's very distracting, especially starting this year. <laughs> so, Cacciatoria wrote this Toccata as part of a larger suite with three movements. The toccata is the first movement and then there are two more before it. But who cares about the rest of the work? <laughs> who cares about the rest of the work anyway? So, well then, Cacciatorian toccata. Are you trying to make this performance go viral? <laughs> oh, this is so distracting. Thank you. 
Next, I'm going to play for you the Chopin Nocturne in C-sharp minor. A nocturne is a piece of music that is associated with the nighttime. And during his life, Chopin wrote about 20 nocturnes. Or is it 21? Well, it's up to interpretation. Anyhow, so this nocturne was written early in Chopin's life, the same year that he had to depart his homeland, Poland. He wrote this nocturne for his sister as a stepping stone to prepare her for playing his second piano concerto, which was actually written before the first one. <laughs> well, I'm not his sister, but he doesn't know it, so I'm gonna play it anyway. <laughs> yeah, so, well, the thing is, this, this nocturne was never published in so Chopin's lifetime because on his deathbed, he ordered all of his unpublished manuscripts to be destroyed. But his manager and publishers kept some of these manuscripts due to the wish of his mother and sisters. And these manuscripts were eventually published many years after Chopin's death, including this nocturne in C sharp minor. And sometimes referred to as reminiscence, this piece is said to have a very nostalgic and melancholic feel, and there have been incredible stories about this. So during the Holocaust, the Nocturne was actually saving lives. Some Jewish pianists would play this piece for German officers before receiving their judgment, and somehow the Nocturne reached those German officers, and they decided to spare the lives of those pianists. I found that to be a really powerful example of the universal reach of music. So let me present to you Chopin Nocturne in C sharp minor.
Two. Next, I'm going to play for you a movement from one of Beethoven's sonatas. Again, because he wrote 32 of them and we don't have quite enough time. <laughs> and this is the second movement from the eighth sonata, nicknamed Sonata Pathétique, although Beethoven never gave it that name. You've probably heard of Beethoven's name. His name is made up of four syllables that are really easy to remember. And Beethoven is one of the most beloved composer in the Western music tradition. And he has spent four decades composing and until now, another 19 decades decomposing. <laughs> He went through a lot in his life and that is reflected through his music. So for me, playing his music is really like having an intimate conversation with him about the meaning of life. However, those are not easy conversations to have because it's really hard to be in a conversation where the other party just doesn't listen. But if you are listening, then let me present to you the second movement of Sonata Pathétique.
Um, I was be playing a piece by uh, Jimmy C. It's called Memory. It's uh, also a, a hair vest number one. It's an urban piece uh, made in this career. And it's a very uh, calm and uh, tranquil piece. And uh, the, the title of Reverie uh, translates to, um, translates to uh, Adrian in English. So that's an honor that you definitely feel in this piece. It's uh, very imaginative and very uh, contiguous.
So we're gonna continue the program with another C sharp minor, the prelude in C sharp minor by Rachmaninoff. Well, so this prelude is the very first one he wrote when he was 19 years young and just graduated the Moscow Conservatory. And soon after it was premiered, the prelude became the favorite of music lovers, so popular that they demanded Rachmaninoff to play it at every single concert he toured. Because of this, the composer became absolutely sick of this piece and regretted that he even wrote it in the first place. So the one time, Rachmaninoff was touring in California and stayed at this hotel for Hollywood stars. However, his room was next to Harpo Marx, a comedian and a harpist. So there they were, two musicians next to each other, one practicing piano and the other the harp, constantly trying to play louder and drown out the other person. Rachmaninoff complained to the managers of the hotel that Harpo's room needed to be moved, but Harpo had this idea. He suddenly started playing the opening to the prelude in C sharp minor for two hours straight, and the harpist won. Rachmaninoff couldn't stand the he couldn't stand his prelude any further and he was the one that demanded his room to be moved because he was so sick of it. Nevertheless, this prelude still remained one of his most popular musical works and music lovers started to come up with those stories of what it is about. Of course, none of these made-up stories were approved by the composer himself, but some of them still survived until today. and. One of the most famous stories among them goes like this. So one time, Rachmaninoff was having a dream. In that dream, he was at a funeral. And from afar, he saw a group of people carrying the coffin. So he began to walk toward it slowly, slowly, but then faster and faster and faster until he reaches the coffin. He opened it and he found himself inside. Again, those are just made-up stories, so... <laughs> Let me just present to you the piece. Rachmaninoff, Prelude in C-sharp minor.
program is a piece by Maurice Ravel named Pavan pour une enfant de fond, which roughly translates to Pavan for a dead princess. The Pavan is a slow dance that was popular between the 16th and 17th century. In this piece, Pavan for a dead princess was supposed to evoke the image of a young little princess from the long distant past dancing at the Spanish court. Nobody knows who the princess was except for Ravel, and he's dead. <laughs> well, let me check. Yeah, he should be dead. I mean, we did have a funeral for him quite a long time ago, so yeah, maybe we could have a pavan for Maurice Ravel or something. So let me present to you Ravel pavan for a dead princess.
now arrived at the final piece on the official program of the Mbasa Suzingin, which roughly translates to To Sing on the Water, a liter by Schubert. So Schubert wrote 630 liters, which means song in German. And the one that I will play for you is actually not the original liter for voice and piano, but rather the transcription for solo piano made possible by Franz Liszt. That way, you won't have to listen to my soul-breaking singing. <laughs> the lyrics of this piece was based on a poem of the, the same name by Stolberg Stolberg, a poet of the same name. And the music in this leader is reminiscent of the type of songs that used to be sung by Venetian gondoliers. So if you've seen images of Venice with those long boats going through the city's canals, the boats are called gondolas, and the person who drives the boat is called the gondolier. And for me, this particular leader is really special. The music is written by a German composer based on a German poem, but the music is reminiscent of Venice, Italy. And then a Hungarian composer was touched by the music and he decided to transcribe it for solo piano. And thanks to that, and the Vietnamese student in the United States actually get to learn this piece of music and of course he learns it with a Russian comrade. And now he is going to play to people from around the world who speak many different languages. And that's what's so beautiful to me, and that's when I realized we can feel the joy and sorrow expressed through music because we all share those feelings. We know what it's like to love someone, to be heartbroken, to feel accomplished or to be let down or to go to a classical music concert and fall asleep. Out, no ticket refund. <laughs> Music has such a power to reach our souls because it is a dialect of the universal language that we all speak. The language of the heart. We come from places that are so vastly different from each other, but we all share one thing in common. A heart capable of so much love. Therefore, I want to invite you to join me in this journey of listening more closely to this language of the heart coming from each other and connect on a deeper level. And what other great way to start than going together on a trip back to 18th century Italy and we'll have a tour through the canals of Venice. Now I did not bring a Venetian gondola and it's too small for social distancing but it just happens to be that there is something on the stage that is also long, made out of wood, and painted black. So then, let me present to you Schubert of the Wasser zu singen.
down the waves, dances the evening glow round the boat. Above the treetops and down the top of the western glades beckons to us gamely the ruddy glow. Under the branches of the eastern glade rustles the reeds in the ruddy glow. Joy of the heavens and peace of the glades breathes the soul in a reddening glow. Ah, with dewy wings on rocking waves, time escapes from me. Tomorrow with shimmering wings, like yesterday and today, may time again escape from me. Until I, on towering, radiant wings, myself escape from changing time.